Okay, folks, I'm soon about to start. All right, everybody, welcome back to the very last panel of this year's uh, Russia conference at NUPI. And the name of the panel is US Arctic Politics, Steady Course or Changing Tech. So it's a kind of follow up uh, from the previous panel. My name is Karsten Fries. I'm a senior research fellow here at NUPI, and I will be chairing this excellent panel. And thank you for being with us all day today, those of you who have been. Uh, I'll promise you this is going to be the best panel, so it's been worthwhile <laughs> to join us. We have 45 minutes, um, so as with the other panels, we will have some opening discussions with the panelists before we open for questions and comments. And I'll try to bring in as much as I can from those of you who are watching. Now, let me give you a little framework of what we're going to talk about. Um, the Arctic states have recently conducted four binding regional agreements, all of which, which had US leadership and three of which have been co-chaired with Russia. So great power leadership um, has been important in building of the architecture of Russian gov uh, Arctic governance as we see today. And US Arctic uh, policy community has deep roots uh, and a long-standing commitment to providing science-based advice as well as bringing concerns of Alaskans to the Beltway. So one question is how durable these policy networks are in an era of populistic uh, domestic politics, paralyzing pandemic, and of course the new geopolitical tensions. And also the Arctic has features in the U new US defense strategies, with particularly China and Russia being cited as security uh, threats toward, uh, towards the US in, in the Arctic and beyond, of course. And we see increased military activity of both Russia and US in the north. So other questions we should like to address is what are the key tenets of the American Arctic security policy? And how have these principles changed under the Trump administration? And what do our panelists see as the next moves in American Arctic diplomacy in the International Arctic and during the Russian chairman, uh, Arctic Council chairmanship? So these are some framing questions. Let me introduce the panel to you all. First, uh, Dr. Mike Straga, he's a funding director of the Polar Institute and also director of the Global Risk and Resilience Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center in the US. He has twice served as distinguished co-lead and scholar at the US Department of State's Fulbright Arctic Initiative and co-director of the Arctic Institute for Arctic Policy. And Dr. Rebecca Pincus, assistant professor and uh, in the Strategic and Operational Research Department in the Center for Naval Warfare Studies at the US Naval War College. She has previously, previously served as the primary investigator at the US Coast Guard Center for Arctic Study and Policy, located at the US Coast Guard Academy. And she recently published some articles on China-Russia cooperation in the Arctic, and also future of the naval strategy in the region. And then uh, Dr. Robert Ortung, a research professor of international affairs, director of research at the Elliott School of International Affairs and George Washington University. He is the editor of a re recently published book, uh, Urban Sustainability in the Arctic, Measuring Progress in Circumpolar uh, Cities. And also uh, investigator on a project on cruise ship tourism and uh, impact of wildfires in the Arctic, to mention some. So it's a very distinguished panel uh, with very good, uh, broad expertise here. Uh, so I will, I, will, I will jump straight in and I will start with you, uh, Sraga. First of all, you are with us from, from, from Alaska. So may I ask you, what time in the morning it is, is it now? <laughs> it's, it's about 5.20 a.m., 5.19 a.m. Fantastic. So that is, that's, folks, that says something about commitment. And also you have been following all day. Well, some of them, some of them have been following all night this, this uh, seminar. Uh, sir, may I ask the first question to you? How, how do you, can you share your perspective of China, Russia, U.S. national politics and aspiration in the, in the, in the, in the geopolitical play of the Arctic? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it is very early, so I'll be, I'll be sipping coffee every once in a while, if that's okay. If you sip some water at the same time. Uh, I, I think uh, much has been talked about this, and of course my colleagues have studied this a great deal, but I think these are extensions of obviously the nation state's view of the, of the globe. I don't think there's anything different here. Uh, if I, I could provide a game analogy, not being pejorative at all to these three countries, Russia, China, and the United States, my own, my own country. But if we're thinking about their role, the, the, their issues, their interests, their influences in the Arctic, it's just an extension to me of their, the national view that the, each of these countries hold. To Russia, 
to the Russian Federation, President Putin has put so much investment, political and, and real money, into the Northern Sea Route, as we all know, the Amal Peninsula, and their relationship, this transactional relationship with China in terms of direct foreign investment in that peninsula. So there's a lot there, right? 20% perhaps of their GDP and exports coming out of the Russia, coming out of the, the Arctic. So for Russia, to me, again, not being pejorative, I see this in a game analogy as playing the game Survivor, right? I mean, a, a 150 million people or so, a declining population, uh, internal strife, um, you know, a, a great country that's under enormous pressure and with huge expanse. But this is a game survivor, uh, a superpower nonetheless, but but it, it's, its economy is not a, an integrated economy to the rest of the world. China, so, so they're playing survivor and part of their survival goes through the Arctic. China is playing the game go. They have long term, decades. This is from Africa to the Arctic. This is long term. The Arctic is not a priority for China, but it is a component, a component in narrative, great power competition, belt and road, a lot of signaling going on. Uh, but we're not, they're not gonna take over the Arctic, but nonetheless, it's part of this great game that will go on for decades and the Arctic will be a piece of it. For my own country, it's an extension, I believe, um, in how we view the world and our role as the United States. The Arctic has not been a priority. It's been a part of the Cold War. Uh, we've seen, as as Jim DeHart just noted, a sort of a quickening of American interest in the Arctic, and we can talk about that later. But for me, and not being pejorative, for me, the United States plays the game twister globally. We have one hand in the South China Sea, one in the Baltic, one in the Mediterranean, one in the Atlantic. I mean, we're all over the map, and that's what a superpower, global superpower does. It plays twister. Uh, in this blue ocean navy that we have and the projection that we can afford. And then on top of that, we've added another little dot on the twister map, which is called a new ocean, the Arctic Ocean. So there's a lot of balancing going on, not just on the defense and national security component, but we play twister across the board. And so all three of these are projections and the Arctic now is a part of this new global environment. It is a global Arctic. So I don't know if I've, I've answered the question, but at least to me, it's an extension and context of these three nations and how this plays out, which is why the rules-based order is so important to me. So I'll, I'll leave it at that if that's all right. Thank you, thank you, yes. Um, I will kind of pass the same question to the others as the opening, opening reflection or the overarching question. So we're talking about Twister. Is that the best way of describing, if you ask you, Rebecca, could you describe the US engagement in the same way or do you have another analogy? I love that so much. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mike. That is a truly excellent way to start off this talk. Um, I agree. You know, I think I've never thought about it in terms of games like that. I like that. But um, the way I've been thinking more about it is that the, the primary um, sort of two pieces. OK, so US foreign policy is sort of centered on this great power competition frame right now, and that is global and great power competition is spilling into the Arctic region. So competition in the Arctic is not about the Arctic. It's about global dynamics. And um, another way of thinking about that is looking at US and Russian and Chinese interests in the Arctic. And really, the opening of the Arctic Ocean is about economics. The security dynamics in the Arctic region have been present since the Cold War. That's about, you know, ICBMs and subsurface activity, and that's not changing necessarily right now, although we're seeing next generation weaponry. But the, those sort of, you know, the shortest missile route is transpolar. That's been true for de many decades. That's not changing at all. But what is changing is economic activity. And so, again, to echo what Mike said, the Arctic is a core national economic interest of Russia. The Arctic is vital to the future of the Russian economy. It is tremendously important. It is survivor, right? Most of their, um, you know, Russia is a resource extracting state. Most of their onshore, easy to access resources are at the end of their life. Most of their resources of the future are in the Arctic zone. So Russia's economic future runs right through the Arctic region. Arctic resources are very important to China, which is a resource importing state. Not as important, right? As Mike noted, this is, you know, a global game. China gets resources from around the world. It ships resources. It ships products around the world. So, yes, the Arctic is interest, interesting, but it's not a top priority. 
for the United States, there we have economic interests in the Arctic region. Alaskan oil and gas is very important, but that is a declining industry. Oil coming out of Alaska's North Slope is it's on the decline. We're having a hard time keeping the Prudhoe Bay pipeline filled. The Trump administration has been trying to increase lease sales and production in Alaska's North Slope largely unsuccessfully, because if you look at the last decade of global oil prices, they've been all over the place, really high in the 2000s, the biggest crash in history following the financial recession in 2008, 2009. They rebounded a few years ago, and now in the last couple of years, they've crashed again. So the oil majors look at Arctic oil, and it's hard for that cost equation to make sense. So from a U.S. perspective, there's not really urgent economic interests in the Arctic region. There are a lot of resources that have sort of interest. They have long term interest, but it's not um, it's not crucial for the U.S. economy. The crucial pieces would be, you know, that that limited North Slope oil production, as well as the fishery, the very important fishery in the Bering. But for the U.S. region, it's much more about this broader, high, higher level great power competition. It's not necessarily about these important specific interests in the Arctic region itself. And so I think it's, you know, in support of what Mike just said, it's important to take this broader perspective um, and understand that competition is much less about the Arctic specifically than about the global great power com competition that we're engaged in right now. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me then pass also the, the word to, to Robert, the same question, but maybe I understand you have done some analysis of the, of the previous administration co compared to the current one. So maybe if you could shed some light on if there's been a change, if first of all, if you agree in this, uh, this way of seeing it, but also if there's been a change between the, the previous administration and the current one in this regard. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. I, I definitely agree that uh, Twister is a good way to look at um, what's going on here. The point I would like to emphasize is that the key to having an effective Arctic policy for the U.S. Uh, is to balance among a number of competing objectives. And those objectives, of course, always include security, economic development, and preserving the environment, you know, dealing with the consequences of climate change. And so, the trick is, of course, to formulate a policy that takes into account all three of these objectives at the same time. And so I think that the Obama administration was able to do this uh, somewhat successfully because it had a very strong institutional base inside the White House and inside the federal government in general. And most of this policy was coordinated through the National Security Council, whose job is to coordinate policy across the federal government. Um, I think the Trump administration has really focused in on just two of these priorities, the economic development, as we've heard, and the national security issues to, uh, you know, sort of leaving aside concern for the environment. And so it also has uh, not developed the institutional structure that it inherited from the Obama administration. In fact, it's really dismantled much of that. And as we saw, uh, you know, the previous speaker has only been in the job for six or seven weeks now, and that, that position had been vacant for the first three years of the Trump administration. So kind of showing that there wasn't a lot of attention paid to these issues, nor a lot of effort uh, focused on coordinating them. And certainly coordinating them from the State Department is a much uh, less enabled position than coordinating them from inside of the White House, inside of the National Security Council. So I think what we're seeing, you know, as we look toward the election coming up here in November for the U.S. presidency, is that events on the ground are really going to dictate what kind of policy we have to have going forward. And it's clear that uh, the increasing number of fires in the Arctic, the thaw, the permafrost, the rain, rain on ice events that you see in Fairbanks, where Mike is now, are, you know, those are increasing in number and those are in increasing hazards for the community. And so it's those things are going to be the priority for the next president, whoever it is. And, and our policy, U.S. policy is going to have to focus on addressing those challenges. Thank you. Um, and and uh, let's now move a little bit into some more specific questions uh, since when you all had addressed the overarching question. And I would like to start with, with Michael. So on the since you are sitting where you are, uh, 
several panels have touched upon uh, Russian military activity uh, in the Bering Sea, not too far from 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 Alaska. And, and maybe you can, first of all, maybe update us a little bit because not all of us know exactly what happened, uh, what has been going on. It's after all far away, and uh, and uh, and not all news are covering it that well here in Europe. And so, first of all, uh, what's what's been going on, and and what has been the reactions, uh, Mike? Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very important issue. There's been uh, I've been using this phrase, the quickening of the Arctic. I, I don't know if it fits well or not, but there is a quickening in in military activity, where there, whether it's in the Bering Sea or in the Barents, you, you pick your favorite sea or ocean. Uh, it, it, it really has been quickening. And just a, a couple of weeks ago, um, a significant Russian Federation naval exercise uh, was undertaken in the Bering Sea beyond the 12 nautical miles uh, of Alaska, so international waters. Um, but it was a significant naval exercise. The reports are 50 naval ships, uh, you know, matching that perhaps in aircraft, but two Russian submarines. Uh, one of le one at least surfaced, which is rare for submarines to do so. A signal. Uh, some some thought perhaps it was in trouble, but nevertheless, perhaps a signal just to let us know that there was a Russian submarine in the Bering Sea. Uh, what's particularly um, troubling is that the the reports from the fishing fleets, the Pollock fleets that were out there at the same time fishing in the 200. Uh, EEZ, 200 mile EEZ, again, within international law, they were um, confronted by several Navy vessels of the Russian Federation and told to clear out of their fishing grounds. Now, this is exactly the thing that I think most of us worry about. This is the miscommunication, the misstep, the accident, the something that perhaps isn't intended or untended or intended to show force, but there's a bad consequence. And so these Russian, these, these U.S. fishing fleets uh, had to maneuver around very aggressive Russian Federation naval vessels. That has raised the flag across the board, of course, not just in the Russian fishing, in the U.S. fishing fleets, but uh, on the U.S. National Security Board as well, including the way in which fishing fleets operate in the Bering Sea and perhaps into the Bering Strait. Uh, this on the backdrop of actually having an agreement with the Russian Federation and the United States on how we will manage maritime shipping and transportation in that very region, the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait. It's done nothing but to amplify the importance of communication, mill to mill, but communication nonetheless. The second thing it's done is it has highlighted the importance of the United States having a viable, vigilant, diligent presence, military defense, homeland security defense in the state of Alaska. Uh, and that's on the heel of, of the Air Force just releasing their Arctic policy which calls for just that, a, 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 an amplification of their presence and their capabilities in the Arctic region. But this story in the Bering Sea will, is not going to go away. We will see more of this kind of uh, incident. Uh, we'll see more of this activity. And I would not rule out uh, that the United States Navy has more and more, uh, does more and more uh, activities here in the Bering Sea on the US side of the border. Uh, but this becomes yet another game emerging here uh, that has some significant consequence because of the interaction between the military of the Russian Federation and and private civilian fishing fleets uh, who have every right to be there as well. well thank you for that um, that analysis and uh, maybe uh, Rebecca since you're sitting in the where you are so to speak in, in the in the uh, with the Navy expertise, because uh, we, we saw last year the, the, the annual Ocean Shield, the Russian Ocean Shield, uh, shield uh, exercise was the biggest one since the Cold War, uh, including the, the, the Baltic uh, fleet and, and of course the Northern fleet, the biggest one ever. Uh, and uh, But of course on our side, uh, we also see lots of Russian exercises outside of our, our, our waters, outside Norway, in international waters, but within the economic zone. Uh, but of course, on our end as well. I mean, as we speak, there are there are freedom of navigation operations taking place with Russian and sorry, with American and and British and Norwegian um, vessels. Uh, we have uh, we have P8 uh, patrol airplanes. We have submarines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I mean, it seems like NATO countries are also more present. So I would like your assessment here. Uh, is this a kind of tit for tat uh, signaling back and forth, or is it uh, is it uh, an ex is it really an increase, or is it any risky, or is it as it should be? 
Thank you. Um, first, I just want to make a quick clarification. The U.S., the current exercises in the Barents are not freedom of navigation exercises. Neither were the exercises in May. So there have been no freedom of navigation exercises. Um, it, that's certainly a topic that gets discussed. It's often reported um, as FONOPS, but they're not. Um, there are no disputed maritime claims in the Barents. The U.S. and allies have stayed away from um, the claims that are disputed in that region. So while these exercises um, are conducted in support of freedom of the sea, they're, they're conducted in sort of support of broad objectives of rule of law and freedom of the seas and all that. They're not specifically um, freedom of navigation operations, which are a much, much, much narrower box. I'm happy to talk about that further, but I just want to throw that quick clarification out there because there's so much confusion. Um, and yes, you know, there's been a clear uptick in the frequency, scale, um, and complexity of exercises by both Russia and the U.S. and its allies and partners, sometimes in conjunction with NATO allies are under the umbrella of NATO and sometimes outside of that. And so we've seen quite a bit of activity in the Barents and in the Norwegian Sea just this year. Um, the U.S. Navy and um, sometimes the Norwegians, the British, the Danes are participating in this exercise, have all been quite active. And it's interesting to see the different constellations of um, platforms and participants that come out each time. As you noted, the U.S. recently sent a submarine into Norway, which was quite a strong signal. Um, there's been bomber patrols. Um, so yes, there's clear uptick. And I think we can see a, a tit for tat type of dynamic going on here, which um, on the one hand is reassuring because militaries have played these games for a long time and know sort of, okay, we'll do this exercise and then, you know, we'll poke you and you'll poke us back over here. And, and in that context, the Russian exercise and the bearing makes perfect sense, right? The U.S. and its allies did some, you know, sort of took the game up a notch. Um, and so now the Russians are, are poking us back somewhere else, right? Um, so that's not surprising, but as Mike pointed out, it's risky. What happens if something goes wrong? That's where there could be a, an unintentional accident or escalation that could be very problematic in this global context of significant tension and a lack of communication. And so the tit for tat dynamics have the, they run the risk of sort of tipping over into an escalation dynamic or a, a security dilemma. And that's something that I think we do need to worry about a bit. Thanks. OK, thank you so much. Um, and, and thanks for the clarification on the on the FONOPS. Um, I, I would like to, to, if I may ask you to, Robert, um, one thing Jim DeHart said that he used the word that he was uh, concerned about China when it comes to the Arctic. And it pointed specifically to the fishery activity in you know, other places in the world. I don't know if you're the right person to answer, but still, I, I, I try. Uh, what's your assessment of, of, uh, of his statement when it comes to China as concerning uh, and, and fishery? Yeah, I'm not exactly the right person to ask on that question. But um, cl clearly, the U.S. policy on China, as he said over and over again, was, you know, China has very assertively stated that it, it considers itself a near Arctic uh, country. So the U.S. is constantly uh, making the point that it's not an Arctic country. The U.S. government is making that point. So I think he wants to make sure that China stays out of all of these issues. Um, and, you know, I think I think w one point I would like to add in, in terms of the previous conversation and, and, and this context would be to put the, um, the actions in the Arctic of Russia and China into the context of their domestic political situations. And so I think in particular in Russia, you, you know, you have uh, the Kremlin and Putin are in deep trouble. You have, you know, very bad handling of the COVID-19 crisis. You have a real economic uh, crisis due to the low price of oil. And you have a very difficult political situation, you know, given what's going on in Belarus and then with uh, the attack on uh, Alexei Navalny. So Putin really needs to change the topic there. And he's using, I think, the Arctic incident we saw in the Barents and, and other uh, 
you know, events around the world to try and focus things on uh, away from his domestic political problems. And so clearly the U.S. needs to push back on these things because Russia will just keep pushing until it meets resistance. But we also need to keep in mind as we respond that um, the, the economic power of Russia is extremely limited at this moment and it doesn't have a lot of ability to project power. You know, sort of doing it on the cheap for propaganda purposes, but Beyond that, I don't think that it has much capacity. So uh, we need to keep those issues in mind as well. Thank you. Um, I think I'll now bring in some questions from the from the from the audience. Uh, time is running fast now. They have been compiled a little bit for me. That makes them very long. So uh, <laughs> some big questions. So bear with me. I will try to read a few uh, a question here. Um, there's one about um, about uh, U.S. national missile defenses. So the question is as follows, and that's the shortest question I could find. <laughs> what is the role of the Arctic in U.S. national missile defense and space situational awareness? What could be the reaction of the Arctic to the Russian arms and hybrid aggression? We'll skip the second part of it. Sorry. So we'll just stick to the missile defense and space situational awareness. Again, Mike, you're sitting where you are. Uh, would that be would you be the right to answer that question? I can I can certainly give it I'll give it some 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 uh, attention and you know defer to my colleagues here. Uh, I'm I'm sitting about a hundred miles north of the missile defense system at at uh, Fort Greely, and uh, it's a significant um, uh, capacity for the United States. We've seen uh, Congress, especially the Alaska delegation, push hard to make sure that that asset is not just in place but is uh, matured and maintained and grown compared to u.s interests i would say that it's not just related to the arctic this is a missile defense system that has uh, close attention whether it's north korea or all the way to the south china sea uh, so it's not just focused on you know deferring or deterring russian uh, federation aggression or uh, or a particular move but this does keep in check, and, and obviously, as Becca noted, you know, the, the quickest way to get anywhere is over the top of the world. Um, Anchorage is nine air, nine hours from any major capital in the world. So, but but this is very much a part of the U.S. shield, whether it's for the uh, Korea, uh, the Indo-Pacific region, Russia, China, but also a vital part of NORAD. So this connection that we have in the North American Arctic between the United States, Canada, and Greenland. So it plays this it plays this cone shaped uh, positioning and deterrence. Uh, so it's it is a vital part, and you'll see in the Air Force strategy a reinforcement of that. Uh, uh, and in in terms of the missile defense, but also coupled to uh, space based assets as well. You'll see more focus there as well. And I would defer to my colleagues as well to pick up on any of those things. Yes. Um, the fact that you are using satellites to, to communicate with us now seems that it's actually <laughs> important and working. Um, anyone else want to comment on this question? Then raise your hand so I can see uh, if you want. If not, I'll move on. And next question is about Greenland. Again, we talk about primarily focus on US policies here. And of course, you start smiling, uh, uh, but let's be a bit more serious. I mean, the, 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 what what is the US interest in, in, in Greenland? Is it is it something similar to what just Mike talked about from the other flank? Uh, or, or and could we see potential cooperation with China when it comes to exploiting resources uh, when as the, as the ice is melting? Uh, does it everything has to be seen through the security prism, or, or is there actually potential for cooperation on 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 Greenland? Uh, I the op question is open. Who, Robert, you wanna? You seem like you were ready to answer. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yours. Uh, I think obviously the Trump administration seems, sees Greenland through the prism of China. And so, uh, you know, an advance for China from uh, the White House's point of view would, would be a setback for the United States. And so that was what was driving this idea to buy Greenland that, that was discussed last summer. But I think uh, more seriously, there there is strong potential. And, and Jim, you know, he, he didn't seem to have an idea of what the U.S. policy would be toward the Arctic going forward, but he was looking for something that we could all work on together. I think one area that might be would be tourism. I know, you know, Iceland has really done very well for itself as, in promoting tourism and, and given its uh, location sort of halfway between North America and, and the European continent. So Greenland could, could easily uh, also participate in that. 
uh, and benefit heavily from you know more cruise ships, more uh, flights coming through there if, if they built up their airport capacity, which is what they're talking about. So I think tourism would be an area for economic cooperation and, and finding ways to make tourism sustainable. We started to see the first electric powered cruise ships coming online now. So there's lots of interesting uh, possibilities to have a sustainable tourism industry in the Arctic, and that could really benefit the local communities, including the indigenous communities, as well as um, increasing the knowledge of you know ordinary people around the world, like Americans coming from the middle of the United States have, have an interest in the Arctic once they've been up there and, and seen what it's all about. That sort of creates a coalition and a, and a constituency within the US and it could help in, in other countries as well to support Arctic concerns going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, please, Rebecca, let me know if you want to chip in. If not, I'll move into the uh, move to the next question. I just I, I will make a quick point about Greenland. Um, you know, I think so often we tend to think about Greenland as an object that these great powers are sort of battling over. And I think it's important to remember that small states um, have a lot of agency in this current geopolitical situation. Um, you know, the United States is coming off several decades of hegemony when there wasn't a lot of competition, but um, you know, if we look back to the Cold War, Iceland spent many years playing the US and the Soviet Union off against each other very successfully. Um, that's sort of the narrative of the Cod Wars, right? And because Iceland has fantastic strategic geography and it wanted to, it was able to extract benefits for that. And I think we see a similar dynamic playing out right now Greenland is very cognizant of its position and it now has the ability to um, play this triangulation game between the US and China and Denmark. And I think it's it's very savvy about what it's doing. I think the, the ground has shifted and it's taking a little while for the US to sort of adapt to the new reality. But um, Greenland is... Um, is behaving very rationally with a lot of agency. And I think this dynamic is gonna play out going forward. Um, so it's an interesting new challenge for the US and I, we're definitely um, rising to that challenge with the amount of investment and interest that's going on across many different parts of the government right now. The, the, um, another point that Jim and the heart brought up, which I, I think we could follow up on it, it's, it was asked about uh, if the existing channels uh, of diplomacy, I mean, there's so many for us in the related to Arctic, but none of them deal with hard security and uh, deliberately so. And, and he was asked if, if, you know, if those existing channels we have, those diplomatic for us are, are, are sufficient. And he said, well, we, we have, uh, if I remember correctly, the, those 60 ones are sufficient. We can use the NATO and the OSCE. Now, uh, I'm not. I'm curious about that because, first of all, NATO NATO Russia dialogue is not exactly very <laughs> dynamic uh, these days, and OSCE is what it is. Uh, very, you know, it has a potential, but not really being used as the forum where everybody actually meets once a week. So, I, I would like to to hear your reflections on on do we need other other lines of communication, so to speak, uh, between the big powers when it comes to. In case of we get the scenarios that you already talked about, in case of escalation, for instance, or unintended consequences, do we need new new for us for for diplomacy? Again, Mike, I will start with you. Well, I think uh, my answer is yes. Um, I do not think you need you should discuss hard security within the Arctic Council. I think the Arctic Council will go uh, will go is feeling the pressures of a new Arctic. Right, it was built a while ago for a number of things that it does really well and sh and that should be nourished matured and supported it, it keeps the arctic in dialogue look the only place the united states and the russian federation talk on a basis that is consistent is the international space station and the and the arctic the arctic coast guard forum arctic council right and th those should be built upon i mean if any, if there was ever a time to build much more coordination and communication now would be the time in my opinion so that's that's one the second is um, there, there are um, many of us who believe that you need to have a mill-to-mill -mill relationship in some ways. Whether it's the, whether it's what used to be the Arctic Chads, the you know chiefs of defense talking that went away with the, with the invasion of Crimea and the in Ukraine. Uh, but, but I think without rewarding any particular nation, 
I think what's happening in the Bering, potential in the Barents, this escalation in activity, the narratives, I think there should be uh, some dialogue at a high level in, in each of the country's militaries that would neither reward or relent on positions um, from any of the eight Arctic nations um, at this time. And, I, and a number of us have been working on some, some ideas uh, with colleagues around the North to see what, what might be possible there. The closest thing that has been very productive has been the Munich Security Conference where there have been discussions in the Arctic Security Roundtables. Uh, that has been helpful. There are other forum around the world. I agree with you. I do not think that it should be a, you know, eight, eight Arctic nations and NATO. That dynamic would be not productive, I think, at this time. Uh, but there should be something along the lines of, <clears throat> of the security, and I'm very interested in my colleagues to take on that. I would add just one other thing, which is as the Arctic, as the, the Central Arctic Ocean becomes more and more important, especially with the Central Arctic Ocean's fisheries agreement, uh, the need for research in what happens in the Central Arctic Ocean is critical. That perhaps is a link to the Russian Federation's chairmanship. Maybe that could be a thing that all nations could rally on, could do nothing but help to discuss and, and coordinate uh, research related to the Central Arctic Ocean Agreement. But, but how we govern the Arctic Ocean, that seems to also be an issue that is part of the Arctic Council, but there are many who have talked about yet another international body of some sort related to the Arctic Council that could take on these very vast and complex international issues as we see this ocean opening. Thank you. Yes, I, I would like to invite the other speakers, Robert, first, maybe uh, both, yes, on the military, the military to military cooperation, but also the bigger questions that Mike put up here, uh, mentioned here. Do we need, do we need new, new for us? Well, uh, from my perspective, I think, you know, to have a coherent conversation, the U.S. needs to get its Russia policy in order and figure out exactly what that is, because at the moment, it seems like we have at least two separate Russia policies, one that's, you know, conducted by President Trump personally, uh, you know, personally with President Putin personally, and then the other one, which is sort of run by the establishment, which is a much more traditional and skeptical view of Russia. And this incoherence is playing out across a number of, of uh, stages. So, um, you know, for example, in May 2019, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, went to the Arctic Council and made a speech where he basically said that the Arctic Council should serve as a forum for military discussions in the Arctic, which was shocking to all the other members of the Arctic Council because they weren't prepared for that. And not only that, then he refused to sign any kind of agreement on climate change. So now, um, this was the first time I've heard that uh, the State Department no longer thinks the Arctic Council is a good place for military discussions and, and that we should do it elsewhere. So that was very interesting um, that, that your conference was able to, to bring together these newsmakers and, and, and talk about uh, what the U.S. Arctic policy actually is. So certainly um, there should be discussion on a military to military basis. But uh, I think, you know, the first thing that needs to happen before we can have a coherent progress on that topic is U.S. policy really needs to be better defined. There needs to be a clear sense of what our national security interests are in the Arctic, what our national security interests are regarding Russia, and then a clear pursuit of those interests. And I don't think that the Trump administration has, has really articulated those interests very carefully, nor is it pursuing them in any coherent way. Okay, Rebecca. Rebecca, do you agree? Um, thank you. I, you know, I think I would agree with um, what Bob just said about sort of a lack of clear focus in U.S.-Russia policy, but I would also link that to China. Um, there's been a fair amount of um, uh, grouping of Russia and China together in um, U.S. strategies, um, national level strategies, but also Arctic specific. And I think we run the risk, um, you know, the more we talk about Russia, China, Russia, China, the more we, we make it a reality. Um, and so that, I tie that back into this idea of a security forum. Um, I think it's important to recognize, first of all, that any new forum is going to be the subject of contestation as the parties participating in it seek access and seek to shape its functions towards their interests. And so that um, that seems undesirable. Nobody wants to battle over a new forum. And I think there'd be a very lively discussion about whether China would be included or not. Um, you know, there's a couple of different groupings, right? There's the Arctic Five, which excludes Iceland, which obviously has very important security interests in the Arctic. There's the Arctic Eight, 
Um, there, you know, and there are pre-existing Arctic security fora grouped among the eight that have been frozen. Um, but obviously the Arctic eight excludes other important actors. We have UK warships operating in the Barents right now. So the UK seems like it would be an important actor. Um, there's a few other countries that we could think about. Um, France is very active in the region, um, for example. And then there's sort of the broader starting from the ground up and, and we would think about China being an appropriate member, which is why I end up being a NATO, uh, Russia NATO Council partisan, because I recognize that it has significant limitations, but the Russia NATO Council is, um, it's well established. It would enable the group to include non-Arctic states like the United Kingdom and France, um, but exclude China. Um, and also it's widely recognized, widely regarded, I would say, as um, fairly ineffective right now. The Russian NATO Council doesn't really do that much, which means it's not that threatening. Um, obviously, Russia has a lot of threat perceptions linked to NATO, but not specifically to the Russian NATO Council. And so starting with a relatively low stakes, low contestation, um, low drama, Forum, I think, is a really interesting idea. I think the Russian NATO Council should develop an Arctic working group. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think that gets us back, I'll sort of circle around, that gets us back to the question of dealing with Russia and China in the Arctic on a separate basis um, and being really specific and articulate about our um, interests vis a vis each one of those distinctly. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. So, okay, let's pass that on to our friends in NATO, the, the Arctic Working Group on the, on the, uh, the, the NATO Russia Council. Uh, I think they need some good ideas so, so to revitalize it. Of course, some of us have bilateral links still, but that's kind of a rare thing and, and it wouldn't be the full, um, full uh, substitution for, the, for what we're talking about here. Um, time is running and, and I'm afraid I had to wrap up. Uh, we are already towards the end of the uh, event, which ends at four o'clock. Uh, so um, let me see some say some concluding remarks. Um, so this was the 25th um, annual Russia conference, NUPI. So it's uh, been uh, uh, been uh, strange to do it uh, digitally, but it worked fine, I think. Uh, so on behalf of NUPI, I I'd like to thank all today's uh, panelists and participants. Um, as well as the audience and those who have written questions, ask really good questions. And we apologize to all of those of you who didn't get your question post, uh, but uh, we did our best as we could to address at least the topics that you were asking about. Um, I'd like you to encourage you all to stay tuned for more NUPI uh, web seminars throughout the fall. And the next, next big event we have is the Military Power Seminar, which will be uh, it's not as old as this one, it's only 22 years old. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll be on this November 16th. Um, we hope we have a US, new US president elected then. Fingers crossed. Uh, the topic will be what to build the transatlantic security relations um, uh, with a new presidency or the continued existing one. So some of the topics we discussed here today, I'm sure will be revisited. Um, so please follow NUPI on the website or social media to be updated on that. Most, last but not least, we will be back with the 26th uh, annual Russia conference next fall. And then, figures cross again, we will be physically together in a normal format and not only digital. But until then, see you and have a good afternoon. Goodbye.